Welcome back. This is Professor Emily Seal talking about my favorite side of theater, which is acting. Um, your textbook begins by talking about how all the world's a stage. And I do think that when I teach an acting class, I'm teaching life skills. So whether you're headed into a boardroom or um, you know whatever professional circumstances you're in, a lot of them require a certain amount of bluffing, a certain amount of ability to tell a story, um, a certain amount of wit and clear um, communication. So I do think that acting is the skill of the everyday man. And so when I'm talking about these acting skills, I do think they're pertinent to your everyday life. And, um, you know, hopefully you'll use your superpower of, of acting and presenting for good, uh, not a con artist, as it were, but um, acting is uh, a transferable skill. So the number one thing that an actor has is an ability to sell their inner truth and an ability to convey that. Meryl Streep is the perfect example of this. She has won countless Academy Awards, um, not for her ability to tap dance, but her ability to evoke emotion in a way that's compelling and relatable. We'll talk about Stanislavski's today um, and his controversial method acting, as we call it here in the States. Um, a lot of what Meryl Streep has is his ability to empathize. She's a good listener. She observes human behavior and she draws on her own experience. How would I feel if I were fill in the blank? And, and we'll talk more about that today. Um, it's imaginative. We talked in the first lecture about an actor being a player, someone who plays, someone who um, can has an imagination and a good actor empathizes with the character and gets in their shoes which is often the opposite of judging a character so if I step in and say oh this character I'm playing is such a bossy know-it-all then when I go to play that character I'm gonna do a caricature or a stereotype of that character rather than this person really does know best and she really thinks that she's helping people, right, if I'm playing that character. So you have to be able to empathize and imagine and um, create a relatable sort of persona. So another thing that the inner truth is always looking for is what's my motivation? So whatever you have on right now, whether you be in public or in private, you thought about what those clothes would say, right? Um, maybe your clothes are, you know, just gym shorts because you want to be comfortable. Or maybe you put on that best pair of jeans because it makes your butt look cute, right? Whatever your motive for getting dressed in the morning, um, it is naive to think that we don't have motivations. Uh, that's one of the conversations I kind of have on repeat with acting students is, um, oh, well, you know, I just do things. There's not a reason or rhyme to it. Uh, well, a lot of those things are what we would call subconscious, right? Um, we don't want to admit we have a crush on so-and-so, and that's why we're wearing our cute jeans. <laughs> but an actor kind of has to look at the more, um, the more primal kind of motives of people. And um, when you see an odd behavior from a character, you kind of have to play armchair psychologist and say, you know, what is that character? What's motivating that character? Why are they behaving the way they're acting? Um, most of us, when we act a certain way, when we behave a certain way, it's in order to meet an end result. So your first paper will um, be over piano lesson and you'll be asking a series of questions and doing kind of a little mini psychoanalysis of a character. All of those questions are to get at that inner truth and to be able to um, imagine that character's shoes. Now for some of you that might be kind of difficult. For one thing the characters are people of color from an age gone by. So they're facing 
problems that, you know, I as a white woman have never experienced before. So it's going to take some empathy. It's going to take some imaginative understanding in order to get into the shoes of those characters. So, so the other kind of side to being an actor is the physical, right? I have another picture there um, of Bill Irwin, who is an awesome clown, physical actor. Um, and sometimes physical acting choices have to do with language and choosing which word needs to be emphasized, whether you're going to play the rhyme of something. Um, uh, you know, if you're speaking in iambic pentameter, you know, doing your scansion, doing your scoring. And um, if you're working in comedy, working on the delivery and the comedic timing of something. Um, in general, British actors, by the way, have a little more emphasis on physical acting. Um, it, now there's much more integrated approaches, but uh, physical details, and we'll talk today when we talk about Stanislavski about the importance of details. But for example, if you're an elderly person and you're portraying an elderly person on stage, most elderly people don't just walk with this kind of generic um, hunched over kind of way that they walk. You want to look at specifically what is your elderly person, what makes them move more slowly, what makes them um, kind of hobble along. Is it a hip pain in their right hip? And that level of specificity um, and in maintaining that level of specificity is important in order to be a believable character. Now that doesn't mean that your character doesn't have good days and bad days. One day they may walk with a limp and then by the end of the show they're healed, but don't make a strong physical choice at the beginning of the show and then just forget to keep that physical choice going. So, and I say emotions aren't emphasized, but often with physical acting, emotions will follow. So something called psychological gesture where you, uh, you know, sit and knead your hands and then that creates that frustration just through the physicalization of it, right? Um, but in general, it's more about outside approach with physical acting rather than imagining this rich and deep emotional uh, beginning. As I already said, you know, with language, you look at the sounds of words and studying the rhythm of things. So the need for what I would think of as good acting, let's be honest, uh, birthed out of a literary movement called realism. I have a picture of Raising the Sun again. I know it's one of my favorite plays. I can't help but go back to it over and over again. Um, but we see here uh, Ruth is ironing and in many productions you get to see the real steam coming off of her iron because they want that level of realism. Um, you know, we want a piano that actually plays. We want, see all that detail in the background of the different pictures and real curtains, real pictures, uh, real uh, lamps that light up. Uh, in realistic literary movement, we have everyday life portrayed on stage. Everyday people, common people in common places dealing with the mundane existence Right, and so this really, when we talk about like Hamlet, he's soliloquizing, he's saying these grand uh, iambic pentameter, uh, larger than life sort of declamations. Whereas realism, we had a need for raw emotion in the moment. That doesn't mean it's never melodramatic, but it's much harder to actually work up cr tears than to melodramatically, you know, pretend to cry. Um, that realism really birthed this naturalistic movement of acting that um, most of us who are modern were trained in. So let's get into the nitty gritty of um, good acting in the modern day. And you can't start without Stan the Man. His name is Stanislavski. Um, you can see there are his Moscow art players who came and traveled all over the world and uh, at the turn of the century. Um, he 
There was a bit of a language barrier there. In fact, one of the words that he used uh, was bit of action, and it sounded to our American ears like beat. And so still to this day, we call them beats when we break down a script, even though uh, most likely it was just bits. Uh, but he he imagined a new kind of theater based on this realistic literary work. And uh, he imagined a kind of theater where people are dealing with... Um, ensemble dealing with everyday uh, struggles, as we said. In the U.S., we call our interpretation of his work method acting. And so you have to remember that this is also the time of Freud, where we have a new interest in psychology. And what's my motivation? These kinds of questions are birthed out of the philosophical movement that we now think of as psychology. So we're really getting into the head of the character. We're talking a lot about the subconscious and subtext, where we may be having a conversation about the weather, but we're really talking about how we want to sleep with each other. So um, there's a whole lot of emphasis on now the um, small details and the small clues to inner uh, deeper waters. We'll talk about this again in a minute, but you know, we have a play like um, Hamlet. You know, Hamlet is the star, and they're on stage the whole time, and spear holder number three stands in the background where Hamlet stands in the foreground. And in realistic playwrights sat down to write plays that were more about the story, less about a star mentality. I think this also has to do with shifting politics, right? As opposed to a monarchy, we're moving, we've had the Bolshevik Revolution, we're moving into um, self-governance and um, democracy. So these groups kind of, um, rather than having a star, I think also just any kind of t entertainment, you know, you go through phases of what's popular and what's cool and what's not. And the, you know, marquee out front having somebody's name in lights, um, you know, was just getting kind of old. And I will say that that I'm speaking very specifically of realistic playwriting. Uh, you know, Broadway, musical theater was not adhering to these rules. You know, it was still standing in stark contrast to um, Chekhov and Raising in the Sun, all these guys. So some ways that we can see daily life rolling out is, um, you know, whereas Hamlet standing downstage soliloquizing, uh, you know, in Raising in the Sun, someone is ironing, we might have a lit cigarette on stage, we might have someone languidly on a bed, especially in a Tennessee Williams play, and we'll, we'll talk more about relaxation in a minute. Um, but those, you know, you can scratch your nose if you're doing a realistic play. If you're doing a soliloquy and, you know, in classic uh, Oedipus Rex, you better not scratch your nose. But in realistic um, playwriting, realistic acting, it should have and feel like a documentary, like everyday life. <laughs> so uh, Stanislavski was Russian and at the time... Um, of HUAC when the House of Un American Activities Committee came in and a lot of the people who were accused of being communist were um, from the group theater. So uh, it, being Russian was not something that um, boded well for his followers here in America. So if you don't learn anything else about what it means to be an actor and how to become more focused, more imaginative. Let me just speak to the power of relaxation. Um, when you take the time to do your yoga, to lay on the ground and breathe deeply, uh, these are the things that we do in acting class at the beginning of class uh, because it frees you up. It frees up your mind to focus. It frees up your voice if you're relaxed. Um, tension is sort of the enemy of uh, performers when their neck tightens up or their shoulders rise like Uncle Fester. Then they start to freeze up and they forget their lines. They can't um, 
move the way that they need to. And I would argue on days when you have a big board meeting, when you need to be on your game, don't forget to exercise. Don't forget to do your yoga. Um, Lay in bed for an extra minute and take a few more deep breaths because Stanislavski uh, really tapped into something there. Um, If you uh, need to be higher functioning, think about filling your car with gas, filling your body and your soul uh, with the energy to get through the day, with some meditation, with some relaxation. And um, there used to be this great TV show on Comedy Central that only lasted for a minute because it was like watching torture, uh, where they would try to distract somebody and then have them do a mundane task, like sing a song everybody would know by putting paper, not paper clips, um, clothespins on their face while they're trying to sing it. And when you're super distracted, you're not very productive. Uh, And so even though it may be counterintuitive, you think, oh, no, I don't have time for my walk this morning. Um, Really, relaxation frees us up to uh, be our best self and to concentrate, which he really um, used to do. And we have these great Uh, descriptions of him working with his students and the way that he used to ask them questions like okay what color are the flowers on the piano and really having them sharpen their mind sharpen their concentration and observation was key he thought uh, to kind of tuning them in to being in sync and putting on a good performance and this can be very difficult, obviously, when it comes to anxiety. Um, actors have to combat uh, their nerves. They have to combat uh, unforeseen circumstances. And it's really important if you're a performer, if you're going into a stressful situation, for you to find your zen. Maybe that means that you put on your headphones before you go in and take your test. Maybe it means that um, you walk around the building a few times before you uh go in to take your proctored exam Uh, you know make sure that you're emotionally and physically mentally ready to jump into that situation Um, and uh, I think centering yourself is uh, the key to a a sharp performance so um, and I mentioned too the importance of specifics which is on the bottom of page 111 and when we go through the given circumstances let me jump back here when we go through the next assignment where you're writing a play uh, not writing a play writing a character analysis over piano lesson um, you really need to get into the specifics because that's what Stanislavski said those given circumstances imagine yourself in that house imagine every detail on that piano and it's those specifics that are really going to help you empathize with um, the emotional state of that character so I have a picture here from um, oh what is the name of that play it's a famous one Oh, oh well. Um, but he's playing a lawyer there, and uh, Jeff, I just cannot think. I'm going to have some more coffee. I should have done a little more centering before I started this lecture. <laughs> so, um, Stanislavski asks us the magic if. So we have to put ourselves into that character's shoes. And you can often do that step by step by immersing yourself in their given circumstances. So um, for this character, you know, what if I were living a hundred years ago? What if I were a person of color? What if I were... um, a second class citizen because I was a woman, right? So when you start to look at all of these jumps between who you are and who they are, and I've played some pretty uh, inexcusable characters, uh, manipulative women. Um, I've played the devil before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have to remember what do they want and what's the differences between me and them and what would I do if I were in their circumstance? And you have to make sure that you empathize with that. And, and the key to that is a good imagination, right? Being able to go there emotionally. Um, and uh, it's going to bug me that I cannot remember the name. It's a famous novel by Harper Lee. To Kill a Mockingbird. There we go. He's playing Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. See? I finally found it. Um, 
I would love to see this production. It won a Tony, or maybe he just got nominated. But, um, you know, playing a character like Atticus Finch, it's larger than life, huge expectations, and, um, you know, finding that character in the ways that you're different have to kind of dissolve away. You have to really embrace who the character is and observe reality. A lot of actors in our spare time, we people watch, right? We notice people's tics. We notice how people react in real circumstances, the ways that they um, get defensive or um, cope, their coping mechanisms. Um, A lot of actors sit around and people watch and observe and mimic. You know, the start of the chapter talked about mimicry or imitation and uh, you know you find an interesting voice when you find a quirky person uh, you know we've been borderline rude <laughs> in sort of following them around and observing them and being a, a student to human behavior in general is key to creating a believable performance because then you take that into your character on stage. You know, Johnny Depp um, famously in his physical acting has taken on different elements from his daily life. Like when he was in um, Sleepy Hollow, he did an impersonation of his scared little dog. (laughs) Or no, that was uh, Edward Scissorhands. He did an impression of a scared little dog. In Sleepy Hollow, he did an impression of a 14-year-old girl, right? Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, he did a famous rock star. So, if you take those physical things that you've observed in everyday life, it adds nuance and uh, grit to your performance. It adds another layer of believability. So, talking about an actor's through line, they have to have an overarching theme and what they want that carries you through the whole play. So once you find your through line, you look at every situation in the play and how your motivation, how what you want affects your behavior in that scene. And it gives it, once again, this is not, um, this is putting something on the, the um, reality of the situation. We say we're trying to be realistic, but you know, very rarely do we go in every single circumstance and think about what I want. Um, but it, it keeps the story going. It keeps your character motivated. It keeps you active in the situation rather than passive and boring. And often, you know, super objectives are often love or money. Uh, here, I picked a romantic picture there because super objectives are also you know, like I said, awesome, often money oriented. And when we get into your questions that you'll be answering for a piano lesson, uh, one of your questions is to kind of find that super objective for the character that you choose. This is a picture from Mean Girls on Broadway. Really wish I had gotten a chance to see this. I hope it tours uh, because I'm a big fan of Mean Girls, the, the movie. And there's, of course, the big four from Mean Girls. So it, I mentioned this earlier, but unified group is called ensemble. So when you're a performer, you have to think about how does my performance help that other actor become a better actor? How does it um, set them up to be the best in their performance? Um, Selfish actors uh, are not ensemble players. They steal the scene by making Um, physical choices for themselves and moments that distract from the story of the plot. Shakespeare famously called someone out in Hamlet. Um, There was a clown character, an actor, who would, uh, you know, distract from the plot by just wanting laughs. You know, he would uh, upstage, is what we would call it, upstaging the story. So Stanislavski really, you know, tried to damp down this star mentality, damp down this um, out for yourself kind of acting, instead creating an ensemble. Sometimes this comes in the form of romantic chemistry. You know, if you're playing with an actor, um, are you um, putting the focus on them? Do you have a chemistry with them? Uh, You know, one of my fun things to do as a performer is to work with free people who, I mean, as a director, is to work with actors who are already friends beforehand because they often have a good chemistry already going. Um, I, I try to avoid, uh, on the other hand, casting, you know, people who are in a romantic relationship already as romantic on stage because then if they fall out, then it gets real weird real fast <laughs> on stage. But, um, 
you know, having that unity, having the individual performances create a sense of togetherness, you know, just something as simple as casting someone with a really low voice next to someone with a really high voice and how like a melody does the mix of their voices create music. Um, It's really very poetic and very fun. And, you know, as actors, we do games to help team build, to help create a sense of ensemble. Um, You know, one of the biggest questions in modern acting is, are you listening? Right? Um, If an actor has already thought about a scene, they say, okay, I want to be yelling by this line. But then their scene partner comes in, and they're just speaking quietly. You get somebody like Anthony Hopkins, who you expect a bad guy to be yelling but he's whispering and it's all the more creepy Um, then you in a naturalistic behavioral situation that were off of the stage you wouldn't be yelling by that point if the other person was whispering so you have to make sure you're listening and that you're creating an ensemble that is believable and that you're in the moment and not just forecasting for yourself so here's the <laughs> by far the most controversial element of method acting, and that is emotional recall. Your book defines it as um, when a performer feels a character's emotions by thinking of the conditions surrounding an event in his or her own life that led to a similar emotion. Uh, full disclosure, I was trained in emotional recall and I did use it. Um, I do think it's dangerous if you're not careful. Um, emotional recall is where you take a time in your own life when you had a traumatic event or a strong emotional response. Uh, For example, if I want to work up tears, I will sit and imagine my sister crying and I'll watch the tear roll down her face and I will smell the smells uh, of where I was when that tear was rolling down her face. And basically what I'm doing is inciting PTSD. I'm inciting using my own imagination to put me back in the emotional circumstance that created and evoked that emotion. Uh, But it works, right? Uh, The question always is whether that is worth that emotional, you know, inciting emotional trauma is worth creating raw emotion on stage. And sometimes I think it can go too far. Um, When I was an undergrad, there was a guy who was physically abused by his father who was playing a character who was physically abused by his father. And and the actor didn't disclose that. It wasn't the director's fault. Um, But you can imagine that is going to that evoking that every night is is going to create a psychological damage. Um, and so we look at the high rates of alcoholism and uh, suicide, great characters like Marilyn Monroe or Heath Ledger, who have been method actors who have overdosed. And um, it can it can be taxing on your psyche to sort of do these science experiments on yourself. And so we do have to be careful. Um, if you're in a situation where you want to str- evoke strong emotion or you just bored this afternoon and want to sort of set yourself there we start with relaxation always start with relaxation and meditation and then really one of the quickest ways for me is smell you know and maybe you've been walking through the perfume counter at pennies and you smell your grandmother's cologne and instantly you're back there with your grandma um those uh, tactile sensations are really the key to evoking strong emotion. Um, but it's a dangerous game, and, and we have to be careful and take good care of ourselves. And um, So at the bottom of page 115, we get into talking about the group compound, the actor studio in New York City that was started by Lee Strasberg. You may have the very first... Uh, exercise you had in this class was answering the inside the actor studio questions those nine formerly ten I don't ask you what your favorite cuss word is <laughs> um, but you may have seen that on TV before famous celebrities uh, being asked uh, their questions about their work uh, on the inside the actor studio but inside the actor studio was born out of this group compound um, which it was during a time of um, financial hardship in the 30s and 40s and so everybody kind of went upstate and had a house together and they were doing this um, psychophysical action they were going deep on their emotional inner resources and these well-known 
these well-known group theater sort of uh, great minds sat down and wrote a lot of books that out of this experience uh, Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, these are probably the most famous um, that led to their protege who were also kind of following in their footsteps and so like I said this was an unpopular way to be uh, Elia Kazan later uh, named names and he said that some of these people that he was at the group theater were communists and um, when he got his uh, Academy Award for Streetcar Named Desire Elia Kazan's a great director a lot of people didn't stand up because he had named names and he was considered a traitor in some ways but we don't we don't really know to what exact extent people really were communists. Naming names was a way of getting yourself off um, of the the limelight and, and passing the buck on to somebody else. So we don't really know the level of uh, truth to that. But um, these great minds, you know, got together, did these acting exercises, kept journals of it, and um, really helped pave the way for a unified vision for a lot of what we think of today as the American method. So the voice, and of course I would be talking about voice on a day when mine is raspy, <laughs> but um, a lot of actor training is centered around flexing the muscle that is the vocal cords, right? Um, being able to project, being able to um, sing, right? Um, when we get into, we're getting into the physical side of the acting, we've just been talking about the inner life, now we're talking about the outer life. Um, vocal training is very important. Uh, deep breathings, diaphragmatic breathing, um, which is, you know, making sure that you have good alignment so that you can make good vocal choices and you don't burn out your voice. Uh, if you're trying to project uh, to the back of the room, by projection I just mean speaking loudly enough for the people in the back of the room uh, to hear and understand you. But projection also includes resonance, right? We need those yummy vibrations, that sense of um, fullness in your voice. Your voice is a way that communicates a lot of your emotion. And for some of, um, for some people here in the South, maybe you uh, have a stiff upper lip, right? You don't open your mouth much. People ask you what a lot. Uh, maybe you mumble, um, and and part of that is an emotional sense of withholding, right? You you are. Um, not putting yourself out there as much and your voice reflects that psychologically. So part of what we do as an actor is we sit down and we kind of create a voice neutral. And we could try to get back to the natural voice and get away from the nonsense. Sometimes you can tell someone's falseness just by their voice. Hi, welcome to The Gap. How are you doing today? Right? And <laughs> you just, ugh, right? There's just not any honesty in that voice at all. And so getting back to a natural voice, finding your natural voice and then making sure it's healthy and that you can project it for a long amount of time and once it's centered everybody kind of has a natural um, vocal range right some of you um, may be faking your vocal range maybe you're a man you think you need to have a lower voice because it's sexier or a girl and maybe you don't like having a low voice you think it's too manly so you speak higher than you should speak um, you know a lot of us, I came into the theater world having to be very cognizant of my southern accent. Uh, it's something that I slipped into very carefully, uh, very quickly. And then when I was doing these great classic performances, like I was prone to do, like Shakespeare, uh, I had to be very cognizant of, okay, uh, you know, white rice, white rice. I <laughs> couldn't, couldn't create those long diphthongs. Um, and I, I love my southern accent. I relish my southern accent. It's not a part of myself that I try to hide. Uh, but when I am in a situation where I'm not portraying a southerner, I want to make sure that my voice is different. So um, I'm going to skip over some of this talk about Asian theater and we will come back to that when we get to um, the other section, primarily just because of time. Um, he, he crams, a, these gentlemen cram a lot into this chapter, and I love talking about acting, so we'll come back to that when we talk about, um, about acting. 
So just as we have to train our vocal instrument and align our vocal instrument and make sure that we're supporting with good breath and can sustain our vocal instrument, another big part of acting is movement. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that we have to be able to jump and do a toe touch like this guy from Chorus Line. Um, but primarily that we can use our body in a way that's expressive and that's once again healthy. Um, your textbook talks about centering and the integrated actor and making sure that um, you're you're freed up to use your physical body in a way that's expressive. So maybe you're going to watch a play and you could critique someone by saying they were just really stiff on stage. I could tell they were physically uncomfortable as a person um, and that came out through their acting is that they were just really stiff. Um, or maybe they were really nervous and so they were twitching or um, using a repetitive gesture in a way that was unnatural. Maybe they're rocking back and forth on their feet. Um, you know, a good actor looks natural and walks in a way that's natural if unless the part d dictates something else um, having a centered integrated physical gestures uh, that help express the meaning of the play they're not distracting from the story but they're adding to the story and um, you know this is the primary way that we understand each other is through our posture and through our physical presence and that's something that I really try to stress in my on-ground classes I teach speech as well that your physical presence says a lot to the person you're talking to and that's really hard for us because a lot of us spend our time sitting behind a computer screen or behind a phone or um, not live face-to-face -to -face interaction but when you're going in for that job interview you know, find a stance, find a posture that's powerful and that taps into your own power and helps express your best self and put your best self forward um, rather than hunching over and, um, you know, coming into this situation with a sense of weakness. Uh, that's that's not going to empower you to, to be uh, productive, to be effective. So I really want to want you to think about, um, just take a quick inventory right now of your body. What are you doing with your body? Is it a power pose? Is it a, something that is um, comfortable for you? Or is your body expressing uh, weakness or anxiety? So, and I'm the worst about this. I am a walking uh, brain in many cases and not cognizant of my posture uh, but when I get on stage I really do try to make an effort uh, to to use my posture in a way that helps tell the story. In musical theater we have what's called a triple threat and we can look at that in terms of musical theater but we can also draw that to everyday acting for a straight play as well. So a triple threat is an actor who can sing, dance, and act. They can do all three. Usually an actor has a strength and a weakness. Um, you know, for um, some actors that can that can do all three, it makes them very marketable. But some plays tend towards one or the other. So if we look at like a Sondheim play uh, musical, if you're going to see Sondheim, there's not going to be a lot of dancing. And the dancing that you have is probably not going to be extensive. It's more of a thinking man's play. And it's more of an actor's play. And it's sometimes pretty hard to sing for Sondheim. Right. Whereas if we look at a play like Chorus Line, this last, last picture, um, it's a story about dancers. So obviously it is dance heavy and the songs are not as difficult to sing. So a good actor knows their strengths and weaknesses and auditions for the right play to accentuate. And a good actor also knows their weaknesses and works on them, goes and takes a voice lesson, go and takes a tap dancing um, lesson in order to pull um, themselves up to the level of a triple threat. So I have so you can think, so you think you can dance on this because my mom loves this show. She loves to watch it. And her favorite thing to say is, oh, she's just got it. Uh, you know, it's not their technical form, their ability um, to hit their marks or uh, physical endurance. It's this sort of enigmatic charisma this personality or star quality, this presence that an actor can bring to the stage, which is sort of the magic of theater. Um, 
often my favorite kinds of plays have a main character who I enjoy just spending time with a kind of character who I just want to sit down and drink a beer with, um, a personality that uh, is entertaining and engaging and human and real. Um, and there's just some people who have charisma. It's always interesting to me when I'm watching a dance number and my eye keeps going back to that one person. And it may be that my eye keeps going back to that one person because they're making mistakes. But it could also be because that person has charisma. They just have a certain quality that my eye, a certain energy that my eye wants to draw to them. And that's something you can't necessarily teach. One of the questions I took out of the quiz this time, he had, you know, what is the method by which you attain charisma? And, and the answer is there's not one. I can work with you on your technical ability to speak. I can work with you on your technical ability to move. Um, I can work on your emotional depth and uh your method with which to create emotional responses but charisma is just that magic thing that you come into a uh, process with that's natural and um and you know trust your gut if you're sitting in a job interview and there's just something about that candidate that you see you know i, I can't put my finger on it but i just enjoy him or her uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. And it goes a long way. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. <laughs> so I've talked about all of these ways that theater is humanity. Theater is uh, poetry in motion. Acting is, um, you know, done by the imaginative. It's magical. But it's also just not tripping over the furniture. Funny story, the second Null Coward play I ever did um, in Hay Fever, I walked onto stage and immediately knocked over one of those uh, folding uh, room partitions that were really famous in the 20s. You know, they're kind of like a screen that you stand behind to change clothes or whatever. I knocked one of those over immediately. And the first thing I thought is, oh, no, Coward would be so mad at me <laughs> for tripping over the furniture. Uh, but this is a great line, uh, you know, working... Um, with as a as an actor part of it is just getting to your mark and saying your line right and helping to tell the story yes it's nice if magic is there yes it's great if the charisma and the imagination is part of it um but at some point we're just meat puppets too <laughs> we're just uh vehicles by which to tell the story we are just agents of action and the playwright is really the one who uh, can help sell it. So when you sit down to watch a play, um, there's a list of questions on page 129 that I think are very evo evocative. Uh, they can help you evaluate. Um, and a lot of this you intuit already, right? Who has a nice voice that you want to listen to? Who has emotional moments that are believable? I ask you when you write your critique of a live production to pinpoint exact moments of acting um, that were compelling or moving or that you didn't believe them right like we said the physical you know the duels and the dances are often the hard thing that we kind of have to stumble past and sometimes they're great and you want to go away and you know watch more of that and then other times you're like oh that wasn't even a little bit believable so acting is not easy <sighs> uh in some ways it is, you just say your lines, but in other ways you have so many things to be cognizant of in, in one moment. And the best way to do it is to prepare, 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 and then just get in the moment and live it and be here now, right? Um, and when you're going into those situations, the boardroom, um, into those professional situations, be an actor, bluff it, fake it till you make it, right? Think about your posture, speak with command, speak with authority, um, and empower yourself to put your best foot forward. Now you may say, Miss Seal, that's fake. I don't want to be fake. It is a side of you, right? You're putting on that persona that is a side of you. And we are the masks we wear. We are the faces we wear. You go into every situation. He started the chapter by talking about this. You go into every situation and you play the part, right? You don't speak to your grandmother the same way that you talk to your spouse or your lover. Uh, you take on these different 
characters, these different parts for yourself. So in situations that are professional, I want to challenge you to put on your most effective mask, your most empowered voice, your most empowered body language, and let it be the best foot you put forward. And, um, you know, go out there and really live. Put yourself out there. So, um, and trust your gut. If you're watching a theater piece, don't overthink it. Be in the moment viscerally. Which actor was compelling? Which actor um, brought you to tears? Which actor made you laugh? Maybe they weren't perfect, but something visceral about the situation. Remember we said theater is live. Theater is messy. Um, but theater is real. And it's exciting. And it's the lively art. All right. As always, thank you for listening.